Willkommen bei Minutenweise Matrix, dem Podcast, in dem wir die Matrix diskutieren, analysieren und zelebrieren. So, uh, John, you, you just said this is 20 years ago today. Well, in the, the, the testing phase, uh, even longer ago than that, that's probably Test 22 years. Testing phase? Yeah. The testing phase. Um, in order for um, the company that I was working for at the time to be considered, um, we needed to perform a, a variety of, of tests um, to prove the sort of bullet time camera theory. Um, and so our company uh, did a bunch of these with a much smaller camera array uh, back on the East Coast. Um, geez, this must have been 1996, 97 okay. uh, time frame. Yeah, yeah. And then, uh, so somebody must have had the idea. Was it the directors? Yeah, it was the directors. And um, one of the things that uh, uh, I think they had seen, or uh, or at least talked about with the visual effects supervisor, John Gaeta, was that there were some Smirnoff vodka commercials um, in which uh, Booth, visual effects company out of France, had done uh, not bullet time, but frozen time where they were able to, you know, they had their camera array that's, that's spread in an arc, and then they had, I think, probably something to do with liquid and bottles, and the cameras sure. all took the picture at the same time, and then when you put the stills together into a sequence, you get basically a moving version of, of a still moment in time. Right, sure. And, and they, had, they had really been excited about that idea in their previous movie that they had done um, called Bound. I don't know if you ever saw that. No, I didn't see that one. Yeah, they did, they did a movie called Bound, um, and uh, there's, a, there's a very sort of slight sort of um, poor man's bullet time where somebody gets shot and sort of falls down slowly, um, and I don't even know how the heck they did that, but um, they, they were really infatuated with that whole idea of time, uh, or at least the, the um, perception of time being slowed down. Yeah, which was just amazing. I rewatched the clips, uh, uh, of course, and it's still amazing. I still like it. Cool. It's still cool. cool. It's still cool. Yeah, and, and the thing that, uh, you know, I remember is that we had, you know, behind our studio um, on the East Coast, we had a one of those, you know, big 50-gallon drums that, you know, you'd put oil in or something. Oh, okay. And we set up a, a camera array around that, and we just set off a big gasoline bomb. And uh, that looked really cool in um, in bullet time form. Sure. Okay. Now the the thing is, is that in, back in those days, um, you know, all this, you you need hundreds and hundreds of cameras to get the fluid mo movement. Wait a minute, right? hundreds and hundreds? You you would need that to to achieve the fluid mo motion. Uh, you would, but, but you didn't you have would. them. We didn't. I mean, for for the for the. I'm not sure exactly. I could probably find out in a couple of seconds how many exact cameras there were for um, the rooftop bullet time shot. But um, how what's many cameras? Your, but, what's your guess? Uh, may, maybe maybe a little more than a hundred. Holy shit! Yeah, I've got some. You know, I've got some reference material. Some some you know some stuff that I can pop in an email. Yeah, you. really. Send it over to you. Some stuff that you might find interesting. But yeah. um, back back in those days, there was this technology that um, uh, was rapidly uh, being developed called um, variable speed motion interpolation. Oh, I I know. Everybody you was know on his knobs turning up and down and making. Well, what it yeah. does is what it does is that it it, it, it I believe that it, it it originated in the technology used to create JPEGs where. Um, it, yeah, it analyzes the entire image, pixel per pixel, and then it looks at the next frame, and it looks for this correlation between one and the next. Mm. So it's, like a you, it's a morph. In, in a way, and you can say, let's turn um, 10 frames into 12 or 14, and it does its best because it analyzes, it does an analyzing phase, and then it does its best to interpret. Now, it doesn't always get it right. Um, and high contrast areas were problematic. So what the VFX team had to do is they had to take, you know, let's say you had uh, 100 frames, you had to basically make 300 out of it or 200 out of it and, and make that, that blend seem smooth. Um, and we did that on the East Coast in, with much fewer cameras, maybe, I don't know how many, maybe 30. Um, 
And to, just to test, because in those days, that technology was still rather young and still a little bit um, unpredictable as far as what you'd get. Knowing you and uh, how you describe things, uh, I would probably say it was very, very, very unstable and super challenging. Yeah, it was tedious. <laughs> yes. yeah. Challenging, yes. It was very challenging. challenging. Oh, I learned yeah. that from you, and I'm still using that. Instead yeah. of, Germans always say, that's a problem. You told me, you say challenging. Yeah, rather than say, oh my God, it sucked. Uh, no, oh no, there was the challenge for the visual effects artist was that... Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, a couple of people died during the yeah. process. Because it was very challenging. So, true, true. Uh, so, 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 yeah, it's, it was the same technology that um, I don't know if you ever saw this other the Robin Williams movie that we that we did the What Dreams May Come with the whole uh, sure. moving oil painting. So we did that as well, and that took advantage of the same technology, this this optical flow technology, where we could assign a brush stroke to a pixel. Mm -hmm. And through the through a series of frames, it would do its best to fo to follow it, and we and they would track on. Okay. And it, it was still young. Um, it still it had its glitches and its uh, flaws, but uh, you know we were able to get it to work. So um, both those two projects back to back, you know, were were really um, challenging. Uh, yeah, challenging and trying to take advantage of this whole sort of optical mm -hmm. flow motion uh, vari variable speed thing and uh, I remember you once told me that the, there was basically one guy who um, what was that he had to paint the stuff that didn't work or didn't record uh, okay so 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 there was a young um, compositor that came out to join our group he, he was from Kodak uh, very sharp um, and uh, a talented young guy and his task was to of course you have a green screen Right, because Neo's doing this, uh -huh. and there's all these cameras all the way around the green screen. But we need a clean green screen, so not only does he need to paint out the wires sure. that Neo's hanging yeah. from, but he has to paint out all the cameras. Ah, sure, okay. So he's got to paint out all the cameras. Now, 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 the other this is before anybody can start working with it. Then once the cameras are painted out, all the 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 exposures from one camera to the next weren't. <laughs> exact. So if you were to play but, the sequence, sequence. Could you? Could you? Get, uh, what, what? What do you mean with not exact? I mean, like a little off or a, a little off. So if you were to play back the original sequence, it would flicker. Ah, uh, okay. Like what? St stop motion guys run into the same problem where the lighting isn't. You know, they took a long time for the next frame of the of the creature, and then when they play it back, it's like, oh, something happened, and there's a little d drop yeah. or. Somebody or, opened the door to the studio in the moment yeah, when they were yeah. making it. Exactly. Or just oh, the man. camera itself. Uh, they're not all created a thousand percent equal. So there's a lot of variables. And so so his task was to go in and, and clean all that up. Oh, and as, as well, then it became, okay, let's turn this however many frames it was you know, this 140 frames into to 500 uh, using the um, using that software. And um, he became so intimately and uh, became so intimately knowledgeable about which frames had problems and which <laughs> frames had this, that or whatever oh, personality man. disorder that um, <laughs> <laughs> that, you know, they figured, you know, these are some of the biggest, hardest most iconic shots in the movie, but let's let the kid do it because he knows it so well. Okay. He's been he's been doing all the prep on it for months and months and months and months and months. Wow! So he uh, so he ends up doing like the the one big hero rooftop bullet time shot was one apprentice. Y yeah, and it's his first. It's the first shot he's ever worked on in a feature film. Wow! What's his name? So his name is Tom Thomas Proctor. And he, he's doing very well now. An interesting story from that was that after uh, The Matrix, I went down to New Zealand and was working on Lord of the Rings. And he wanted to join the team. And he said, but I only have one shot on my reel, and it's that shot. And he <laughs> <to> me. <laughs> so did they take him? 
Yeah, I convinced him to take him, and he did a great job down there with us too. How would you how would you have to convince anybody if somebody pulled off something like that, especially with the knowledge that you had from from all of it? How could yeah, you even yeah. think? It was just a, yeah, he um, you know he uh, wow. Yeah, I just said yeah, we should hire this guy for sure. You know, wow. Um, and, 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 uh, do you remember what you did on Lord of the Rings? Just I'm curious. He worked on the first two. Mm -hmm. um, he did. He he actually. My I remember him doing a lot of work with um, Gollum on the second mm -hmm. movie. My memory of that and, mm -hmm. and working with him with, on that. Um, but again, wow. that's a long time ago too. Sure. So yeah. So the other uh, uh, the other shots uh, in the in the five minute clip. Is there anything you contributed to? The other shots? Yeah, some of the, some of the shots that I worked on, um, I, d I did. I spent the most time on the power plant where Neo wakes up into the real world in the in the pods. Ah, okay. And mm -hmm. the lightning's coming up, and the Doc Bot comes down and mm -hmm. grabs him, mm -hmm. all that. So, so that was my big sequence um, because I had learned from the from the bullet time tests that yeah, I don't want to do that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Is that no? Come on. So you really you really said. I don't want to do this. I'd rather do that because this is a pain in the whatever. Yep, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, um, okay. Uh, aside from aside from that, what we call the power plant sequence, um, uh, I did. I worked on the elevator mm -hmm. where Neo has Trinity, and they're standing on top of the elevator, and he he shoots the cable, and they mm -hmm. come flying up, and that's a the elevator shaft is a miniature elevator that really? we need to. That we need to keep cycling to make it seem like they're going up and 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 up. Excuse me, you need to make cycling. Cycle. So let's say that you know it. The the miniature itself maybe was only ten floors that they pulled the camera up through, but we needed to make it seem like it kept going. So I had to keep cycling it down. You know, recycling it, doing the old cartoon trick, looping it, looping, looping it, basically. Yeah. Ah, okay. Like in the background. The background in the Flintstones. It's always yeah, the exactly. same palm tree in the same house. Right. Now, the, the thing that made this difficult was that the miniature, and I don't mean to pick on the miniature uh, builders, but it wasn't exactly symmetric. Uh, each floor wasn't exactly the same measurement, you know, and oh. it, because it was slightly off, it never lined up. Um, so I had to, you know, that was, you know, that was my headache, um, just getting that to work and having to stretch and distort and, and things like that. So I, I worked on that. I also worked on um, the dojo fighting scenes mm -hmm. in the in the tests we had done, you know, this whole hummingbird uh, fists and mm -hmm. fist pay and all this and that. Um, and uh, okay. so, uh, wow. Uh, but uh, but pl primarily I spent my time on that power plant, which was uh, um, a big, a big sequence, a lot of CG and, uh, yeah, and CG in those days, I mean, well, uh, one shot must have took ages to render even. Yeah, well, the, the, the final shot that we had to go out the door was what we called uh, HP, HP4, the history program, where you see a vision of these fetus gatherers, harvesters, mm -hmm. going along and they're grabbing these things and they're sucking them up these mm -hmm. tubes. And that was one gigantic CG shot, and that was very problematic, very long, very involved, very complex. And um, the render times were showing that um, I think originally the projection showed it would have finished a, about four years ago. Um, <laughs> four years ago. Yeah. Wow. Maybe six. And it was 2012 <laughs> figured out. So that was just to make to make uh, to make that understandable. The projection means that uh, you say to the render farm, basically yeah. to the computers, how long would it take uh, for you to render that? And uh, a big thought, deep thought, tells you it's gonna be 20 yeah. years. <laughs> <laughs> so what? So you had to leave out stuff, or what? what so, so what we did was we, um, we, we instead of turning it into one big CG shot with all kinds of volumetric calculations, um, it was chopped down into um, 
almost like a pre-composite where there's a background layer mm -hmm. and we like that and that's working and then this comes in front of it and we like that and that's working and then some things are being done in 2D in comp versus 3D in CG where we can get away with it and that wow. it, it, sp it, sped, it sped it way, 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 way up. So you basically did a, a, a compositing, a multi-layer, like a multi-plane Disney camera. Yeah. Where you would stack yep. all the stuff uh, on top it, of each other. It, exactly, yeah. yeah. Wow. It, it, the close-ups weren't so bad. It was the, all that distant stuff. Um, you know, back in those days, render times were, were painfully long. And uh, even even in compositing, they were long, painfully long. Wow. That's why everybody smoked cigarettes. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, so to uh, to round that up, uh, uh, when you look back at the movie now, or if if one looks back at the movie now, it's it's easy to understand why it was such a groundbreaking thing. Everything in there has entered pop culture, and it it even came down to being parodied over and over again, and right. uh, being used again for uh, for serious purposes, being parodied again and again and again. It's just absolutely crazy. Whereas the second and the third movie, everybody tries to kind of forget that. Yeah. In a way. Yeah, I mean, everybody sort of feels like um, the Matrix sequels are right up there with the Hobbit movies and the Star Wars prequels as being, you know, having plenty of plenty of money to be done well and uh, lost the. Lost it along the way. Somewhere. Lost it along the way. Yeah. Um, yeah. With the Hobbit, with the Hobbit, it was just it was so <coughs> horrifying to watch for me because I was so looking forward to that. Yeah. And there was it was just basically one big visual effects reel. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And and you could sort of see that starting to happen on King Kong. Sure. Um, yeah. With the dinosaur sequence yeah. that I didn't understand yeah. at all. It even didn't look that good. I mean, the Kong was great, but this this thing where they all top on uh, top on uh, yeah, top of each other. Jack stuff, Black is running through. It, it didn't look good. It. Yeah, it's terrible. Yeah, terrible. Terrible. It start. You're right. It started with that because you would say, "Wow, this is another Peter Peter Jackson thing, and this is going to be awesome." And you would watch it, and there comes to that sequence, and you'd say, "Well, well, well, well what's happening? What, what what's going yeah. on?" Yeah. yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. That yeah. was that was a major disappointment. Yeah, the other. The other uh, two sequels, the Matrix sequels, it, it seemed to me that they didn't have anything to say. It was action and visual effects, but no, nothing. Uh, it, it, the, the, the first Matrix comes across as we have an information to tell you that probably the world is, is like that and you don't know it. Right. And that was great. And then the second and the third movie, it was just like, there's this big rave going on. Everybody's like yeah. dancing, and then we're shooting, and we'll have that guy in that battle mech, and he's doing Rah! all the time. Yeah, that was basically it. Yeah, crazy. Yeah, yeah. I, I, uh, it, I think a lot of people. Yeah, it, it didn't have any of the previous charm or intrigue. Really, it didn't have it all. What do you, what do you think is the reason? <laughs> uh, it's a good question. I had always, I had always been under the impression that the, uh, the siblings. Um, uh, had this story already intact, but maybe that wasn't the case because ah. some of the, some of the rumors that I had heard about what was going to happen in the second or third film never came to pass. Uh, so I, I don't really know if how much of that story was already on paper or just in their heads after the first one. That that's something that I don't know. Okay. Um, but I, I don't really know what what to blame it on. I know that. You know, in the in the original Matrix, um, you know, there wasn't a gigantic budget. It, it it sort of plays out a little bit like like a like an indie film with interesting visual effects in it. In the sense that, you know, they had to choose their their spend their money wisely. They want to put put the money in the right place, and they're really really you know. Um, really focused on certain sequences being how they vision them in their heads and really good. Whereas, you know, like in all these movies that we're talking about that suffer from this, it seems like they just keep, um, they just keep throwing more gratuitous, uh, eye candy, uh, without it having the need to be there. So I remember, <coughs> I, I remember now that we had a similar conversation with 
when we were talking about how we would approach Mara and the Firebringer, and you said something on the lines of, it's, I don't remember exactly, but it was like, it's not always bad if you don't have uh, enough money because you, then you get to think about what you really need. Yeah. You know, it yeah. was a lot along the lines of that. And I remember that we had this conversation when we were uh, talking about that we always wanted to show the visual effects from Mara's point of view and not get too involved, not cycle the camera on the Firebringer and do the fancy stuff. So <clears throat> this was one of the first shots we talked about where the Lindworm is actually... He turned his back on Mara and ran into the uh, into the Renaissance Fair. Yeah. You remember that? And it was yeah. quite. It was. It was not like uh, Peter Jackson would do it, like flow, fly over the thing and get yeah. close to the teeth and then get back to Mara. Yeah. We just let it happen from from afar and then cut back to her because she was the story. Yeah, I remember yeah. that. It yeah. almost feels like it was, uh, you know, um, uh, eyewitness camera kind of thing. Exactly. You know? Right, yeah. and uh, so I remember that we had the conversation when you uh, you laid it out to me that probably it's not always bad if you are, sorry, if you're limited by the budget because then you get to really think about what visual effect would you really need and is there maybe something that you just leave out and instead tell a story. Yeah, yeah. yeah that was exactly. Yeah, that was something that probably John Lucas and the prequels didn't really... Think about no. too much. No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, because I remember in that movie there was always this. Uh, we have a planet. We go down to a city. We narrow down to a sky tower. We go into the sky tower. Somebody's talking in the sky tower, and he's uh, leaned against a big window, and there is gazillions of <laughs> things flying out there. You know, and it was always. And then we go back, 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 and there's another planet. We narrow down on the planet. You know, it was always like that. And yeah, not about yeah. the characters. Yeah, yeah, I uh, I glazed over those for sure. <laughs> is is something changing now? Um, I think it's interesting that we, we, now that you have so many, so much of the audience is watching TV at home, um, and you have your target audience, which is the youth who are watching it on iPads, and that that you don't need all the big budget, high resolution, fancy cameras, if you have a compelling story, the kids are watching stuff that they just are so involved in the story that, yeah, maybe it was shot on an iPhone. I don't know, you know? Um, so I think that uh, certain things are changing. I think, I think that now is a great time for budding, you know, storytellers and screenwriters to get their stuff out there because you can now at least do a short or something interesting or compelling without having to have a whole gigantic film crew and big expensive cameras and lighting rigs and things like this. Yeah. And the other thing is that, I mean, there's a, I actually have an app on my iPhone where I can put 4K fires and sparks and smoke into the picture and composite it. And you watch it on a 4K monitor right here and it doesn't look as bad, you know. I mean, it looks like probably like visual effects from 10 years ago which is not that bad if you don't have your camera moving. You can actually track it. Yep. Yes. Yeah, so, crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. So, <laughs> so of course, uh, people like you would have to up their ante to, well, make it better than the iPhone. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. True, true, true. True, yeah. true. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, to get into the... Uh, uh, the next steps, what, what, what's your next big project? Do you, do you, uh, do you know what's happening? Well, we're, yeah, we're, um, we're going to be busy with this uh, Chucky, with our friend Chucky for a while, as well with... Um, our friend Chucky. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. We hate it. Um, and uh, as well with this, this, this Hansel Gretel thing. Hansel and Gretel. Okay. Yeah. Retelling. Gretel and Hansel. Yeah. Gretel and Hansel. Uh, uh, who's doing it? Who's the director? Um... I don't, don't know. know. I don't but there know. is one. <laughs> yeah, well, for for the Chucky movie, it's a it's a it's a uh, fairly new newcomer. His name is Lars Klevborg, and he's from Norway. Another, Sounds like it. The, another European film nut. Um, and <laughs> and uh, yeah, um, I have to look up uh, this 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 Gretel one because I I don't, don't actually know who it is. Hmm. Well. It doesn't. It doesn't matter right now. It will. 
it will matter once you start uh, uh, writing all those emails and receiving all those gazillion shots. There's one, one very, very, very last thing, John, that uh, if, you, if you still got five minutes, uh, because I keep telling that story over and over again because it was so crazy. You were telling me about uh, the situation that you didn't, you weren't very fond of, which was part of the reason you said why you accepted Mara and the Firebringer as a job. Because I, uh, you told me how the uh, how these moments uh, happen when there is a a, a viewing of uh, visual effects, like a two seconds clip, and you basically yeah. said there's this movie, uh, this uh, little theater and uh, a projection room. Everybody goes in there. It's about 20 people. Everybody has laser pointers. And uh, everybody says in this two-second clip that's looping, I don't like this, I don't like that, I don't like that, I don't like that. Right, right. right? And, uh, and then you would redo the shot. And you said in the next week, there would be the same clip, but uh, worked over. And there were different people sitting there and, and, and demanding changes. And you, you were really frustrated about all that. And then I said to you, well, for Mara, it's going to be me and, of course, Bene, and maybe the producer, and that's it. And it took about two minutes, and you said, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's true. I mean, that, that, that scenario doesn't happen on every project, but certainly there are some that have really gotten out of hand with that. And, um, yeah, I mean, we, we find that we think we're done with a movie, And then shots come back and they want touches and revisions and touch-ups and changes and revisions and months and months later. It's, it's, it's crazy. It's wow. Crazy. And there's not always people who uh, are, how can I say, who are into visual effects. Right. 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 Sometimes. Because, but, you know. because, yeah, because the other thing that we do a lot of, which we don't like to advertise too much because we don't want to do any more, um, is this cosmetic um, enhancement. Are you talking about breasts? No. No, no, no. Just like they might... You know, there might enhancement be, sounds like... You make would. make uh, so a woman's blemishes or wrinkles smoother, or they might say, okay, here's Tommy. Can we darken that beard, especially under his chin? Um, you know, these kinds of things. You get asked to do that a lot. And those are the kinds of things that will come up very, very late where somebody obviously is in a screening with a laser pointer and going, she has bags under her eyes. It's like, well, she always has bags under her eyes. That's her look. We should reduce that. Can we do something about that? Can we get a bid? You know, these are the things that happen. Um, and, uh, wow. yeah. <laughs> uh, didn't, you, didn't you tell me about going back to the Matrix that, uh, what's her name, uh, the female uh, lead? Uh, you had to redo her... Her, her face skin for something oh yeah we did we've done a lot of that we've definitely done a lot of that yeah. and um, don't want to we yeah well that's the other thing is we're not really by contract we're not really meant to to discuss too much who has been given the treatment because it's don't you don't you say uh, anything about my beer being darkened right <laughs> in this video <laughs> no <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll send. I'll what send it over. Do? I'll send it over yeah. after we finished. I'll send it over, and uh, you you gotta we'll treat, we'll give you the treatment. Yeah, and I I would like my face a little, you know, a little oh, not too. as. Me too. I have to lose the chipmunk <laughs> and the frog neck and all that. You know. <laughs> and you want your hair to be dark again? Darker and f more full. Yeah, like I was when I was young. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so I'll send the clip over, and you redo it, and then afterwards. Uh, I'll cut it up. Yeah, that's yeah. that's 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 a good idea. Probably, I I, I just want to feel thirty five again. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so thank you very much, John, for that. Um, uh, thanks for going back in time. 